Welcome to the second part of the RSET training, Crop Mapping Using Synthetic Aperture Radar and Optical Remote Sensing. On Tuesday, April 4th, we learned from Dr. Marino how to pre-process Pulsar data, run Python code for machine learning of multi-temporal Pulsar data to classify different crops, and evaluate the accuracy of the classifiers. Today's webinar, we'll be focusing on crop classification with a time series of optical and radar data from the Sentinel-1 and 2 platforms. Today's guest trainers are Dr. Christoph Ostier and Matej Racic from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. There will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. Homework will be made available on April 11th with a due date of April 25th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinus Martin. After participating in this training, attendees will be able to explain how polarimetric parameters are used for crop condition assessment, demonstrate how to perform Sentinel-1 SAR pre-processing to derive quasi-polarimetric parameters, perform a calibration of a SAR-based vegetation index to NDVI, monitor crop growth with multi-temporal polarimetric SAR data from Sentinel-1, examine crop growth using a canopy structure dynamic model and time series of Sentinel-1 imagery, and classify crop type using a time series of radar and optical imagery. It is now my pleasure to introduce the guest trainers, Dr. Krzysztof Ostier and Matej Racic. Dr. Krzysztof Ostier works at the University of Ljubljana, Faculty of Civil and Geodetic Engineering, as a professor of geoinformatics and remote sensing. He received his PhD from the University of Ljubljana and was a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique in France. He has specialized in the use of optical and radar satellite imagery with a particular focus on radar interferometry, classification, time series analysis, and big data processing with artificial intelligence. He has led or collaborated on projects funded by the European Union, the European Space Agency, the Inter-American Development Bank, and National Geographic Society, and other national and international organizations. Applications of Earth observations range from agriculture and forestry to natural disasters, water detection, societal environmental impact, and archaeology. Matej Racic is an assistant and PhD candidate at the University of Ljubljana Faculty of Civil and Geodetic Engineering. His research focuses on the intersection of remote sensing and machine learning. He started his academic journey at the Faculty of Computer and Information Sciences, where he gained extensive experience in data manipulation, algorithms, and machine learning. During his master's, he combined these fields to explore the field of satellite image time series, and since then, he has been utilizing his knowledge from both fields to tackle the range of challenges in Earth observation. Uh, thanks, Sean, for the introduction. My name is uh, Christopher Stier. I'm coming from the University of Ljubljana, and uh, in the next couple of minutes, I will be uh, presenting the crop classification with time series optical and radar data, together with my colleague uh, Matej uh, Racic. And I would also like to mention uh, Anna Potocnik Buchwald, who has helped us with the presentation and with the preparing of time series time series data. So uh, to begin, uh, we will start with satellite image time series. We will define what satellite image time series are. Then we will see where we, where we can get this time series. We will focus a little bit on the Copernicus and the Sentinel series of satellites. We will define analysis ready data. We will do the time series analysis, and then we will focus on Sentinel hub. We will use Sentinel Hub as the platform for processing the data. So we will introduce the Sentinel Hub statistical API, machine learning capabilities, especially EO Learn and EO workflow that are that is built on top of, of EO Learn. So 
So let me start with the slide that you have probably seen many, many times. This is the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and in those 17 sustainable development goals, space is present almost everywhere. I would like to invite you to have a look at the UNOSA web page, Space for SDGs, and see how, uh, how uh, space is being involved in the individual goals. Especially Earth observation is present in, for example, zero hun hunger, uh, clear water and sanitation, life on, uh, on land, life below uh, water, so almost everywhere. But this was not the case in the, begin in the beginning. We have to go many, many years back to see what has happened and how we have come to the situation that we are using Earth observation or remote sensing to track, to, to monitor the Earth uh, for a long period of time. Uh, but it was not until 1970s when Landsat was launched and Landsat changed, uh, changed on how we look at our planet. With the beginning of the imaging with Landsat, we are able to see what has changed in our environment uh, on the whole world, actually, in the last 50 years. But what I believe is also a very important, or one of the most important things that has happened is the development of Sentinel Hub. Sentinel Hub was developed in 2000, was, was launched in 2016, and it actually changed how we process space Earth observation data by simplifying every aspect of those of this of this processing by enabling process, processing huge amounts of space data without downloading the data, uh, just doing it on the cloud with a simple, simple, simple scripts, and uh, so that almost everyone can process terabytes or petabytes of, of data. Since then, many similar platforms have been developed. We have seen uh, the expansion of Google Earth Engine capability, the, uh, the, the launch of Microsoft planetary computing and the others. Uh, perhaps also to mention is the Copernicus data access service that was launched, launched this year to simplify the access to the Copernicus, uh, uh, Copernicus data. Okay, so we have long and dense time series. Uh, satellite image time series, or SITS, as it is, uh, it is abbreviated, and you will see this a lot, uh, are available uh, for the last 50 years. Medium and high resolution data is av available free. What does it mean, medium and high resolution data? High resolution data is the data that is available at 10 meter resolution so basically landsat and sentinel uh, data, uh, uh, resolution data we have uh, landsat archive that is completely open uh, in the year 2008 there was a decision to open the arc the archive back to the to the first first images that were captured by landsat and this enables us to see what has changed in, on our planet in the last 50 years but when the, air, the Landsat archive was made open, this made, made an explosion in the exploitation of data. Since 2008, everyone is able to process time series of data. When the European Union was designing the Copernicus system, there was a lot of discussion of uh, how to disseminate this data. Should the data be free? Should the data be, uh, should the data be uh, payable? But at the end, it was a decision, and I believe it was a very important decision to make Copernicus data complete, free, and open. So when we begin with Landsat, we have uh, data back to the 1972. However, those data is, uh, not, is not very dense. We have Landsat data every 16 days, and in the last decade or uh, almost a decade, we have data that is much denser. We have weekly data, we have daily data, and uh, this enables us uh, to process the, 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 the information on, on the ground in, on a completely different, different way. And we also have harmonized satellite image time series. 
harmonized lens and sentinel data, harmonized optical and radar data, harmonized sentinel and planet planet data. And we also seen harmonized optical and radar satellite image uh, time series. So I already mentioned several times, everything happened with the Landsat. Uh, with the Landsat in 1972, and we have image of every area on the, on the land every 16 days. However, Landsat is an optical satellite. And optical satellites are very much affected by clouds. And this, is, this can uh, cause difficulties, difficulties when we are doing time series analysis. Therefore, there, has, there have been many initiatives to densify those time series, to make those time series, let's say, uh, weekly time series or even daily time series. And the European Union has launched the Copernicus program. So Copernicus is the program that is being financed by the European Union or its member states and is currently the most sophisticated Earth observation system or system of systems. It is composed of a, from, of a space component with a series of Sentinel satellites from Sentinel-1 to Sentinel-6 and it is co composed of Copernicus services. In addition to that, we have in situ component. Uh, the Copernicus services, which are maybe not as much known as the Copernicus satellites, are land monitoring, emergency ma management, atmospheric monitoring, marine environment monitoring, climate change, and security. There are many different organizations who are providing these services to the end users. And by providing these services means that these services are simple so that everyone, uh, civil protection, rescue, uh, rescue organizations, uh, farmers can use this, uh, these services. This is, of course, driven by users. Users are defining the, what Copernicus should do and what Copernicus should not do and uh, they are defining the program at a higher level. For the space component, we have the European Space Agency and UMETSAT, European uh, Meteorological Satellite Organization, who are defining and building the satellites. Actually, ESA is being uh, responsible for, 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 for the satellite launch, launches and uh, building, and also the operation, operation of, the, of the satellites. And from in the space component, we have a series of satellites where, where, uh, coming from Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, 3, 4, 5, Precursor and 5, and the Sentinel-6. In addition to that, Copernicus is providing data dissemination infrastructure. Because if, if we have such good quality data, if we have, if we have data coming from different platforms, we have to put this data into the hands of people. And by providing simple to use data dissemination infrastructures, infrastructure, we are able to give everyone access to uh, this valuable, valuable uh, data. So in the Copernicus space component, we have a series of, sat uh, of satellites. Each satellite uh, each satellite group is, has a, at least a pair of satellites, like Sentinel-1, A and B, which is for radar observations, Sentinel-2, A and B, for high resolution optical observation, Sentinel-3, A and B, for medium resolution imaging and altimetry, Sentinel-3, uh, 4, A and B, for uh, the observation of the atmosphere from geostationary orbit, Sentinel-5, and uh, with the precursor satellite for the observation of, of the atmosphere from low orbit. And what is really important here is this is just the first generation of the satellites. So every satellite will be replaced before the end of their, their life cycle by a new satellite. In our webinar, we will focus on the Sentinel-1 A and B and Sentinel-2 A and B because we will be doing mostly uh, radar and high resolution optical optical observations. So let me begin with Sentinel-1. It is a radar satellite. The first one was launched in 2000, 
2014, the second one in 2016, and it is aimed at, at observation of land, forests, water, soil, and agriculture. It is also very important for rapid mapping in case of natural disasters. Sentinel-1 is also uh, capable of doing uh, ship traffic observation, observation of ice and sea. It is a C-band synthetic aperture radar. We will see what, what does it mean for the observation of vegetation in a couple of minutes. And it is uh, observing the Earth in a 250 kilometer swath with a resolution of 5 by 20 meters, which can be resumed, for example, to about 12, 12 and a half uh, meters. It is observing the Earth every 12 days. This is uh, true for each of the satellites. And in the case when we had two satellites, this time, uh, time revisit time was six days. Sentinel-1 is also very important because of interferometric radar, because uh, this uh, enables us to observe the surface motion and also the vegetation if we are taking into account the coherence. This is a typical radar image where it's not very exciting. It's black and white. This is just one polarization. And what you can see on this radar image is, of course, the, the relief, which is, uh, which is very clearly seen on, on the images. You can see water bodies here. You can see water bodies over there. These are, this is, these are actually flooded area. You can see an urban area here, a river over there and different uh, different agricultural fields in that area the area here is covered with forests and uh, this is uh, not clearly seen on radar image uh, on a radar image uh, like this sentinel 2 on the other hand in hand is an optical satellite and the first one was launched in 2015 the second one in 2017 and it is actually the satellite that was specifically designed for observation of vegetation. So it is a satellite designed for observation of land, water so surfaces, coastal areas also, and uh, soil. But the main focus was vegetation and agriculture. The orbit of Sentinel-2 repeats every 10 days with a, a pair of two satellites. There's the constellation of, uh, of two satellites. It repeats every five days. The main scanner is the multispectral imager, which has a SWOT of almost 300 kilometers with different resolutions from 10, 20 to 60, 60 meters. So <coughs> if we observe the, the bands of Sentinel-1A and B, we see that they are almost identical satellites, almost but not completely. They are comparable, uh, very, very, very well comparable. So they have bands that are very similar, uh, but they are not exactly, exactly the same. So this is the, these are the spectral cur cur curves or spectral signature for different kinds of, of materials like soil, vegetation, and water. And here you can see the bands of Sentinel-2. We have one band, a couple of bands. We have four bands with 10 meter resolution, which are in the visible part of the spectra and near infrared part of the spectra. Visible part so that we have visible uh, RGB images and near infrared part because of the vegetation. This is a typical Sentinel 2 image with the, uh, in, the, in the visible part of the spectra, the same area that was covered before. It looks much nicer, so you, you can see here forested area, you can see again the urban area. Water can be seen, but not, not that good as it was on the optical images, and you can see a lot of agriculture areas here. So you can see uh, different stages of agriculture at different, different times. However, Sentinel-2 is an optical center, meaning that it is affected by clouds. This is the statistics of cloud coverage for the area of Slovenia, where we have some areas that have some images that have less than 10% of, of cloud cover, some images that have between 10 and 30%, and some images that have more than 30% of cloud cover. We are, we, we are not able to see to get all the time steps that are available. We have 
we are theoretically able to acquire an image for the Sentinel-2 every five days, and even more frequent if we are at the, at the latitude that are uh, farther to the north or to the south, but in practice, cloud coverage is prohibiting this observation. So let's go back to time series and see how we generate time series, how, this, how time series are constructed. Well, what actually is time series? This is a set of images taken over the same area of interest at different times. They can, the images can be taken by the same or multiple sensors. We can just have Sentinel-2, we can just have Landsat, we can just have Planet, and the, uh, the images are taken with the same sensor, or we can combine this uh, data together. And we are getting a stack that we are able to process at a time series. And time series enable us to understand how Earth is changing. It, they enable us to determine what causes the changes and predict the future changes or what will happen according to what has happened in the past. In addition to that, time series enable us to discriminate features. There are certain features on the ground that we can only discriminate by time series analysis. For example, compare uh, some, uh, uh, some wheat and grassland. At certain period of time, we are, ne we are not able to discriminate, discriminate between wheat and grassland because they look the same. They have uh, the same amount of reflection in near infrared, the same amount of, of reflection in green and red. But if we, we take an image a couple of weeks later, a month later, we are able to discriminate these two, uh, these two land cover classes. So grassland and wheat or corn and so on because of the, of the, of the typical de time development of, of uh, vegetation. So let's have a look at the time series of Sentinel data. Here at the top, you have the date. Uh, and here it's the same date. On the left, you have the classical near infrared, red, green visualization. And on the right, you have NDVI. I was trying to construct a time series over the whole year, and I was uh, selecting only cloudless images. So you can you, you can see very good images, and still there pop some images with clouds like this one here or this one here. And what is even more important, if you observe this date here, you can see that in certain months, certain months, you don't have good quality data. So we are missing data in certain certain months. The time stamps are not following, let's say, five days uh, interval, but there, there can be some gaps uh, in between. If we do the same with Sentinel-1 data, you can see here the date, and you will see that the date is incrementing by seven days. So I have selected one image every seven days. And I could even select more than one image every seven days. So for the radar data, we can we can really have or we really have dense time series. Here you have the vertical horizontal polarization and vertical vertical polarization. So you see the differences between these two. And it is really important that the radar is not influenced by clouds, and we are getting dense time series because every image can be included in the in this in this time series. So to be able to process time series, we have to have something that is called analysis-ready data. Committee on Earth Observation Satellites defines analysis-ready data as satellite data that have been processed to a minimum set of requirements and organized into a form that allows immediate analysis with a minimum of additional user effort and interoperability both through time and with other data sets blah 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 it's called data which is ready to use the end users like myself and you we don't want to bother with all the processes that are behind we want to have data that is ready for the analysis we want to have data that has been pre-processed in a form that we can use python scripts or any other other scripts to analyze the time series of data 
efficiently without doing a lot of uh, pre-processing. So what does it actually mean, analysis ready data, and who's providing ready, uh, analysis ready data? Well, in the past, the users had to do this by themselves, but nowadays data providers are generating RD data. And of course, RD, uh, what is RD depends on applications. The first thing and the most important thing is, of course, image clipping. We have to get a, 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 a data cube uh, of the same area. This is very important because we are observing, observing time series for a certain area. But we have to do also masking. Usable and unusable data masks are probably the most important factor in generating analysis red data. Because for the, for the successful anal analysis, we have to know where do we have unusable data. Where in our time series we should make a, 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 a jump and not uh, count data that is misleading. Because if we have clouds on the image, this is, of course, not the data that we would like to analyze with uh, time series analysis. We, we just want to uh, put a, not a value uh, at, at that mom moment in time. Sometimes atmospheric correction is done, so the, 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 uh, the effect of, of the atmosphere is eliminated. We have to do the pixel alignment because we don't want to detect changes in time series data because the pixels are misaligned. And the pixels are misaligned depending on the system for a couple of, of, uh, of meters or pixels. And this is a factor that we have to correct before doing the, the, uh, the processing. And we have to do the sensor alignment or sensor harmonization. I already mentioned several times the Sentinel and Landsat and also the Planet Scope. And the end user, for example, myself, I don't want. I don't want, I don't need to know where the data comes from. I just want to know what is the reflectance, what is the NDVI at a certain uh, period of time or a certain timestamp. And therefore, we have to join this data together into harmonized time series uh, data. An example of this harmonization is the, is the Landsat Sentinel harmonized time series, where we are taking Landsat data and Sentinel 2 data, where we are doing atmospheric correction, geometric resample, resampling, normalization, band, uh, band adjustment, and then we are generating harmonized time series products in the, in the grid of Sentinel 2, for example, with the resolution of uh, Landsat, with the, with the spatial resolution of Landsat but at a much better temporal, temporal resolution. And such, such combined time series uh, is really a valuable tool for, uh, for the analysis. So what we have to do with the harmonization, when we have two different sensors, like the case here for, uh, for, Sentinel, uh, for Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, you see that the timestamps are different, of course, because uh, Landsat 8 is taken images every 16 days and uh, Sentinel 2 is taken the images every five days. And this dense time series of data enable us, enables us to, to do a much better interpretation. OK, what do we see on radar and optical images regarding the vegetation? This is uh, also a very important, important factor. We have seen these spectral signatures uh, in the past, and you probably were aware of, of, of those, uh, those curves. And here you can see the typical response of vegetation to different wavelengths. We are seeing a strong reflection in green, a very strong reflection in near infrared caused by chlorophyll in the leaves. And we do see some absorption bands here caused by different compounds or chemicals like water present uh, in the vegetation or water presence in the soil like here. And uh, this is what we are trying to observe with multispectral data. With multispectral data, we are generating or collecting bands at different wavelengths. But indices are those who take the advantage of this wavelength, uh, wavelength characteristics. So for example, uh, we are using vegetation index or any other re re index to observe the vegetation. 
Uh, regarding the radar, the situation is even more complex. For the radar, we have different frequencies, we have different bands, as, as they are called. The frequency, the frequency or wavelength can be 3 centimeters, 6 centimeters, 24 centimeters, or 65 centimeters. And depending on this, the radiation is being scattered either on top of the vegetation, like in the X band, or at the bottom or in the middle of the vegetation, like uh, for, for L band and P band or somewhere, somewhere in between, like the situation is for the C-band. So, for the radar backscattering, the radar backscattering is influenced by the characteristics of the radar and of the surface. We have the wavelength and frequency, we have the polarization, either horizontal, or vertical, or combination of those two. The radar has a, a, has a typical incidence angle and, of course, a typical resolution. These are all the characteristics of the radar system and the user cannot uh, influence them. And then we have the surface. We have the surface with different structure, with different phenomena on the surface, with different roughness of the surface, with different conductivity and the electricity of the surface, and with different orientation. For radar backscattering, the orientation of the fields of the structures on the ground can uh, change the, the backscattering drastically, or uh, this is what we can observe on radar images. One of the features that is extremely valuable with uh, radar is also uh, radar interferometry. In addition to backscatter, radar is also measuring the distance between the satellite system and the ground. So radar actually measures the distance from the satellite to the ground, and this can, uh, this can then be used for different purposes, uh, especially if we are observing imaging, images taken from two slightly displaced orbits. If these two orbits are displayed by a couple of meters up to a couple of uh, hundred meters, we can, we can process the data in an uh, interferometric way, uh, way. In that case, we have phase differences between these two, between these two uh, images that are caused by different factors. The first one is parallax, because the images are not taken from the same position. The second one is elevation differences. We can observe survey movements, we can observe or we are observing atmospheric phenomena. If we elimin eliminate this atmospheric phenomena and we know the parallax because, because we know the position of these two of the two satellites or the image where the images have been taken, we can observe, for example, the elevation on the, on the ground if the surface, surface movements are not present or surface, surface surface movements if we do know the elevations. So radar interferometry can give us elevations in the, in the meter accuracy and displacements in the millimeter accuracy. But for observing the vegetation, a side product of this interferometric processing is extremely pop, uh, popular or important, and that is the coherence. Coherence is uh, is a measure of how well two image pairs correspond to each other. The coherence of an insert data pair represents the magnitude of the complex correlation between two images on a pixel by pixel basis, meaning that for each pixel we have a correlation between the images taken a couple of days apart. This is the case of Sentinel-1, where the images are taken six days apart, 12 days apart, and 18 days apart. And you can clearly see how the, the coherence is getting lower and lower. And coherence is a measure of amount of noise in the interferogram, and coherence is a measure of the development of vegetation. Because in, in 12 days or, or 18 days, the vegetation is being developed or is, has, is changing, and therefore the coherence get, gets lower and lower. It still remains very high in urban areas because there's not, not a lot of change over there, but wherever we have vegetated areas, we are getting lower coherence. 
with a longer longer time span. So if we have a, a change of coherence between two images, it means that something has happened to the vegetation. Either vegetation has grown, or the the, 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 the crops have been have been harvested, and so on. So the, inter, the, the coherence of the interferogram is a direct proxy of the development of uh, vegetation. <coughs> yes, but with optical data, people are mostly using NDVI. And is NDVI enough or do we have to use other indexes? So there exist many vegetation indexes, the most the basic one is the classical vegetation index, which is a ratio between near infrared and red. Since this, this index uh, is not normalized, NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index is being used uh, very often. So the difference between near infrared and red divided by the, uh, by the sum near, red, near infrared plus infrared is the most commonly used uh, vegetation index. It is normalized to minus one and one, and it is very easy to interpret. In addition to that, many other indices exist, like enhanced vegetation index, the soil adjusted NDVI, uh, and others and others. Uh, if you have a look at the index database, you will see many of those indexes listed, including with the equations. And I suggest that you have a look at this index database and to see what indexes are available and if they are suitable for your purposes. So this is just an, uh, an, a shorter list from uh, index database with the tag agriculture where you can see the first 16 indexes with different equations uh, uh, suitable for different sensors or suitable for different uh, applications. And of course by, by, by so many indexes the, the very important question is which one is the best or maybe if i say which one is good good enough so if we are looking at the sentinel 2 bands here you can see this is a smoothed curve of the development for one year you can see that uh, these reflectances increase during the summer and decrease in, in, in the winter and they are lower in the beginning of the season but they almost all follow the same, the same curve. And here you have the same situation for different indices. The first one is NDVI, and you have the NDVI here, uh, very easy to interpret curve. You, in the beginning of the season, the, it increases, and then it decreases at the end of the season. And more or less all the other e indices follow the same, the same curve for the same pattern, they are just shifted a little bit and probably they are very much correlated. And this is true. If we see the correlation between 22 images, uh, 22 indices here, NDVI is the first one, so the correlation between NDVI and the 21 remaining indexes that are listed here, you can see that they are not, not just uh, slightly correlated they are extremely correlated or they are almost the same so to answer the, the question from the beginning yes ndvi is probably probably enough okay we have defined the time series we have defined how we generate time series now we have to go to the time series analysis for vegetation for vegetation map here you have a tree and the yearly development of, of this tree in the spring we have very bright green leaves then we have uh, in, in summer they are start starting to uh, to brown a little bit and then you have autumn and winter where there are no tree there are no leaves on the tree if we are taking the observation of ndvi we have seen a yearly cycle so the uh, the in in the beginning of the year the ndvi is low then it starts to increase it, is, it gets the highest point and then in, it decreases uh, in autumn. This is for the northern, northern hemisphere, of course. From this curve, we can define, define the vegetation parameters. We can define the beginning of the season. We can define the end of the season, of course, the length of the season, 
the the base the base value here the the middle of the season with the highest value the maximum value here and of course the amplitude amplitude of this uh, development and this enables us to observe different vegetation types this enables us to observe different crop types and to define the parameters for the crop crop growth just to remember we have uh, very very green leaves or green leaves then we have brown uh, red leaves uh, we have uh, yellow leaves and uh, brown leaves and this is uh, all related to spectral signatures of these leaves uh, so then the ndvi changes this is for the green leaf and for the other leaves uh, the spectral signatures are a little bit different and vegetation index which is a ratio between near infrared and red reflects this uh, development uh, very, 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 very well. Okay, let's have a look at what we see with the, with the development of vegetation. This is the, the NDVI development for European beech, Pagus sylvatica. And here below, you can see the images of the same tree during the whole, the whole year. Uh, why is this important? Because I want to, uh, to, you to have in mind that what we see with satellite image time series is not exactly what the observer on the ground would notice. For example, for the Fagus sylvatica, we have observers who are observing the beginning of the season for, for different uh, tree types or different crop types. And what, when they mark the, the beginning of the, of the season, they mark it at the time where they see the first green leaves on the plant. And this is, of course, not something that we cannot see on satellite images. The, 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 the trees, the, the, the vegetation has to develop much further to be to, to, so that we are able to see the increase uh, over here. The same is at the end of the season. The, observers, the in-situ observers who are marking their calendars and generating the databases of uh, different uh, tree or crop tribes, they're seeing the, the browning of the vegetation, something like that, that, that here. And again, this is not something that we are, that we are able to detect with uh, satellite image time series. We might detect this before or after actual browning is being marked on the cal calendar by in situ observers. So we have to have in mind that while we are observing the length of the season, this might be a factor that is not the same as a human interpreter is doing on the ground. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. We have to just know that the start of the season and after end of the season have to be shifted a little bit by, by maybe a couple of weeks according to the observations that have been done by in situ uh, observers. Okay, let's move to time series of images. Here you can see the development of agricultural fields from April to November. And if I show you this, you would, you would immediately be able to recognize the development. You would say probably uh, in, immediately that nothing is happening in April and May but then things start to develop in June and July when, we, when certain fields are completely differently colored, so different, uh, different crops are growing. And then in August and September, uh, we have harvest, harvesting and we are seeing a lot of, of, of bare soil. So when we are doing time series classification, we can do it in several ways. The first one is to do it in a quasi time series classification. What does it mean? We just stack the time series of images one above the other. For example, we take the time series of NDVI and stack the, the, this time series of, uh, one on top of the other. And we are getting kind of multidimensional data and we are doing multidimensional classification. This is exactly the same as we are doing multispectral classification on one image, except that we have one multispectral image with, let's say, 13 bands. In our case, we might have one multidimensional image, one stack of images with, let's say, 20 or 30 bands or timestamps, and we are doing the classification. In that case, 
we are classifying with the with this this stack of images but the time sequence is not really considered this the classification is being performed on a time time signature of event like the multispectral classification is being performed on spectral signature of the event however more important is do the full time series classification where we take the the, uh, into account the development of, of uh, the time development of different features. And here we have to deal with different distances. We are comparing time series, and we cannot just compare time series in a Euclidean way because we might have some changes between different years, between different features in different areas. So we have to do something more sophisticated like time time uh, this dynamic time working where we adapt the beginning of the of the growing season or uh, any other element and we stretch a little bit this uh, time series so that we are able to compare similar events with uh, uh, with different time series time series classification takes many many of the algorithms or methods that have been developed for speech recognition because for speech recognition the first obvious thing is time shift and then we have different frequencies, different speeds of talking, and for, for doing uh, correct uh, speech, the speech recognition, we have to do uh, a lot of dynamic time, uh, time warping. So how do we do classification based on time series? We have a series of uh, known time development, like the case here for barley, maize, rapeseed, triticale, and wheat. And then we have a new unknown time series and we want to compare this time series. As I have shown previously, we compare uh, the differences between, between the unknown and the known time series and we classify uh, the time series into the class that is closest to the, to the, <coughs> to the unknown series. You have probably done many times the uh, single image multispectral classification, and there we are where there we are dealing with um, spectral signature, and this here is uh, are actually time signature. So every crop type, like triticale here, has a characteristic time series signature, in the same way that every crop type has a characteristic spectral signature. Yeah, until now, I have shown you mostly beautiful time series, but life is not that beautiful. And when we are dealing with, especially with optical data, but also with radar data, we are getting a lot of noise. This is an actual time series uh, uh, collected or generated straight from uh, data coming from, uh, from images. You see a lot, of, a, lo a lot of noise, a lot of jumping up and down. And is this jumping up and down uh, 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 influenced by, by clouds or is it real, real development? Is it harvesting of, of crops? Well, we have, we have to do the time interpolation or time integration. This is the image with uh, the time, uh, time series without aggregation. This is the time series with five day aggregation where you can see that some noise have been uh, eliminated. This is the time series with 10 day uh, interpolation and with one month of uh, interpolation. So in that case, in this case here, we have one point in time every month. And this is probably enough for time series, time series an analysis because you can, you can clearly see the development of different uh, tree types in that, in that case. And we don't, we don't have a lot of noise. Another factor that is very important is time synchronization. Uh, satellite images have different timestamps. They are generated uh, regularly every five days, but then we have overlapping, uh, overlapping orbits uh, or overlapping scenes when we get information either every two or three days uh, at northern and southern uh, latitudes, and we have images coming from different satellites and different sensors. So to be, to be short, our time frequencies are not uh, 
equally spaced. We don't have equal timestamps uh, of the observations, but they can be like, uh, this is the case again for Sentinel-2, they can be uh, around five days or less, but we can have also uh, images that are taken 15, 20, 25 days or 30 days apart. So we have to synchronize the, the time steps. This is the original Sentinel-2 NDVI time series. What you can see here is, of course, a little bit of noise jumping up and down. And what you can see also is that in some, some uh, time spans, we have a lot of data. We have images really every five or three, three days. But there are, er there are time spans where we don't have any information or uh, we, we, do, we are having missing data because of the clouds uh, uh, and so on. So what we have to do is we have to compare time series like this, which is not uniformly spaced. And this is uh, spaced. And this is difficult to interpret. That's why we are introducing weekly averages where we take the timestamp every Monday or every, every, every Sunday in the week and compute the values over there. Or we can even do a, a monthly, monthly uh, aggregations. What we can do with, uh, with NDVI, for example, is to use the maximum NDVI or the mean NDVI in the, in the period of one month. And in that case, you see we have a similar development, but much easier to interpret time series as this. In addition to, to that, an important factor is how long must the time, the time series be? When can we classify the features on the ground? Do we have to wait until the end of the year or can we do the classification after one month or two months or uh, a couple of months? And we, have to be, we, can, we also have to consider are we or, or comparing the data for this year with the data coming from previous year? So we have to see, is it enough to have the data just for the first two or three months, or do we have to have uh, more information? Probably at this stage here, we would not be able to classify different crop types. But if we are going uh, further in the year, like to, the, to, to June, we would be able to increase the accuracy of classification significantly. So here at the beginning, the classification would be uh, of very bad quality, but when we are uh, taking more data into account, we can have better quality uh, data. Meaning that the beginning of the year is enough for the classification of different crop types. Why is this important? Because if we would have to have the whole yearly time series development, this, mean, this would mean that we would be able to do the classification at the end of the year, basically for the previous year. But what we would like to do is to be able to do the classification in the beginning of the year and to be able to classify uh, after a couple of, of months. We also have to compare this data with previous years. Here you can see the development of uh, the same crop in different years. And you can see that the years are comparable. However, the starting of the season is being shifted uh, according to the, to the, to the shifting, shifting of temperature and precipitation for that year. So it's basically the influence of, uh, of climate and climate change, if you would like. But you also see some anomalies on this time series. And these anomalies are those that we are interested because that can mean uh, either some natural disaster, it can mean uh, drought or uh, the impact of drought or, or, or a similar e event in, 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 the, in, the, in the crops. Okay, so we have now seen how to generate time series and now we are moving a little bit to the practical part and we will be discussing the Sentinel hub. Uh, Copernicus data, that's petabytes of data generated uh, every, every year uh, has to be put in the hands of users. European Commission is very well, well aware of that, and that's why they are developing simple tools to use this, this, this data. 
And this year, they have launched the Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem, the CDSE, to be the new way to get uh, Copernicus, uh, Copernicus data. In the past, this was kind of uh, neglected by the European Commission. The Copernicus uh, uh, Data Hub was uh, providing the data, but the interface was not very efficient and it was hard to get uh, right data very quickly. And that's why uh, the Commission, together with the European Space Agency, is uh, launching the Copernicus Data Space Ecosystem that will allow the search and API access to different, uh, different uh, data and, of course, the processing in uh, Jupyter Notebooks in the cloud with uh, different, uh, different technologies. And here, Sentinel Hub will be uh, one of the most important or the central parts of this, uh, this, uh, this initiative. The Copernicus data space ecosystem will be fully operational this year. Now it is, uh, you can also already try it and there will, there will be new functionality coming by to the, to the end of the, of the year. So what is actually Sentinel Hub and what does it uh, provide? Sentinel Hub was launched in 2016 to simplify access first to open Earth observation data to the Sentinels, to Landsat data, to MODIS data. Later, also commercial, commercial Earth observation data was made available through Sentinel Hub, and the users can also add their own data, like raster and vector data, digital elevation model, models, uh, uh, other, vector, uh, other vector data, like land parcels and so on, but also drone and airborne data. Sentinel Hub is following the OGC standards and provides VMTS, VMS, and uh, VMC, VCS uh, services that the end users can use in their cloud GIS, web and mobile applications, desktop GIS like QGIS or ArcGIS, ArcGIS Pro, and most importantly, they're able to access Sentinel Hub through scripts to Python API, to R scripts, to NV, NV scripts. And this is actually a game changer in the frame of Earth observation. You don't have to use any sophisticated uh, data provider to generate time series of data. You can use one service, Sentinel Hub Statistical API, to get time series and to analyze time series within the same, the same script. So if you, if you register and uh, join the, the community, you are able to, to, to launch the Sentinel Hub uh, Playground or, or, or AO Browser, and you are able in seconds, really in seconds, without knowing any programming, generate products with this. You can make these uh, nice visualizations by using different band combinations, like here, and with a little bit of knowledge, you can process petabytes of data in seconds on a really old computer. You just need a browser and a little bit of JavaScript. And if you give this power to people, magic happens. Uh, applications pop up where you expect them and where you don't expect them. In agriculture, in forestry, in water management in monitoring uh, air traffic or, or trucks from space, in monitoring ships for, from space, in every domain that you can imagine and uh, there's someone who has a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of courage that writes a script and uh, processes the data and generates uh, the, the results. This is really a democratization of Earth observation. Now, it is not uh, everyone can use their own computer to see what is happening to any part of, of the planet. So how to use this uh, data and uh, how to get the benefits of, of, of this? First, you have to create the Sentinel Hub account. Just head over to, uh, to uh, uh, sentinelhub.com, Google it, and then click, click on the 
sign in sign in but button okay so uh now i suggest to move to the browser and to do the live demonstration so head over to sentinelhub.com and you have here the sign in button if you click the sign in button you will be uh, going to the sign in page and here if you don't have the account you have to sign up for account so just click the sign up button and uh, enter some uh, user details first name last name and very important enter the email address here you have to generate a password confirm the password and agree with the terms of services and then you click the sign up button so when you create the sentinel hub account you will have uh, you will enter the trial mode and you have to send your registered email to my colleague Matej, matej.racic at efgg.uni-lj.si because you will get credits for processing and advanced use of Sentinel Hub. European Space Agency and Synergize are sponsoring the use for all the RSET participants and you will have enough credits to do time series analysis including the machine learning uh, with that with that credits when you have registered for the sentinel hub account just log in on the page so enter your username and password and click sign in and you will be immediately transferred to the to the dashboard where you can see how many uh, how many uh, credits you still have, what is your usage, usage, and so on. And then switch over to the EO browser, or you can just search for EO browser. And Sentinel Hub EO browser is the way to go. And when you enter the EO browser, you, you can uh, continue with the tutorial or you can just skip the tutorial and log in. Once you log in, you will see here, it means that I'm logged in. You can change the language to uh, any other language and you can start exploring, uh, exploring the data. I will move to a part of, uh, of Slovenia here and try to search some images. You have uh, Sentinels, Sentinel-1, 2, 3, and 5P. You have Landsat data. You have even the har harmonized Landsat Sentinel data. You have uh, other data like MODIS, digital elevation model, and even Copernicus uh, services. We will focus on Sentinel-2 data and I will click here on the advanced search and first I will lower the cloud coverage to, to let's say about 20% approximately and I will be searching for Sentinel-2 data and uh, the, the uh, Sentinel-2 uh, level 2A. Of course, I have to change the dates and I will try to uh, to to search for some images in uh, in the in the summer of 22. So let's say from the 1st of July to the end of August. So let's click here. We have here the date range from the 1st of July to the 31st of August, and we will do the search immediately you get the search results and you can visualize one of the images so this is the area you can move out you can zoom in zoom out you can move, move around and change the the visualization here we have the true color image you can switch to false color image and this is processing on the fly you can do do uh, some other combinations like ndvi what sentinel hub is doing there has there's nothing pre-computed immediately when you click another uh, visualization it is getting the data processing the data for the for the frame that you are looking for the area that you are looking uh, this is uh, 
extremely fast, but it takes some computational power. So I will switch to NDVI. Now we have the NDVI for the image, but you can also uh, select any of the other layers here, or you can create a custom script. So you can create a custom visualization with different band, band combinations, and it is computed immediately without uh, any, or almost without any delay. I will go back to, to the, this prepared visualization and I will complete, com click NDVI because we have seen that NDVI is very good for vegetation, vegetation observation. Okay, so now we have here NDVI and you can see different fields here. Again, if we switch to true image, you see that there are some agricultural area here uh, and you, you, you see some narrow fields. Switching back to NDVI, I will try now to generate the statistics for the area uh, that is shown here. What I have to do, I can put a marker uh, on the on the in the area, and when I put a marker on the area, I'm getting here a new toolbar, including the statistical if info for this area. And if I click this statistical info, uh, the time series of NDVI is being generated. So I'm getting one month of data for this point, uh, that, for the point that was selected. And you can see here the time development for one month. Of course, I can change the cloud coverage and I'm getting uh, less data points. But what I would like to mention is here the export C CSV button. This button exports my time series to a file that can be analyzed later. Okay. So let's use another tool. I will use this uh, area uh, button here and I will draw an area. Uh, in, in, uh, I will manually draw an area. I will try to select an, uh, a field. So I'm clicking, clicking, and I will finish with the second, with the second click. So clicking on the first point. So I have here an agricultural field. And I can generate the statistics for this field. This is a uh, 0.04 square kilometers, I can generate the statistics in the same way. So now I'm generating Sentinel-2 level uh, 2A statistics, and you can see not just statistics for one point, you can see also the standard deviation for those points. And again, we can make uh, two-month statistics, and here you can see that this is computed on the fly, and we have to wait a little bit that the statistics is calculated and we, ha we have to lower the amount of clouds that we allow in this statistics. So we are eliminated cloudy images and we can go to one year. And in that case, it will take another couple of seconds to compute these statistics. And after we have done this, we can export the statistics to a CSV file and analyze this CSV file uh, later. OK, the statistics has been computed for, for one year. And I just for the demonstration pur purposes, I will click also the five years. And you can see how now the, the computation of the statistics is going back five years in time. So this means that every image for the last five years is being loaded. The statistics is being computing or computed on this uh, on this polygon, and the statistics is being then is being dis displayed here and stored, and we can see the time st stamps where the images have been uh, taken. And I can even lower the amount of uh, clouds that I allow, and this changes a little bit the time uh, the time series. Uh, this will take some time because there have been uh, a lot of images taken in the past uh, five five years. So we have to be patient, and of course, this is uh, in that case. In in this case, we are using a certain amount of credits for this uh, this computation. Okay, so we are uh, almost finished. Okay, a couple of seconds more, and. Uh, we will have the complete five-year time series for this field. And by clicking the export button, my file is being downloaded and stored locally. 
and I can then uh, open this file and uh, down, uh, and use it with with Excel. So with EO browser, we can uh, generate time series of any of the layer that is uh, present in the EO browser. We have seen Landsat, Modis, Harmonized uh, Sentinel tool, Senti uh, Landsat time series, and of course also the Sentinel one data. Here we can see the vertical horizontal polarization, the gamma. Here you can see the time series of, uh, of uh, radar data for the point shown here, or we can see the time series for optical data, Sentinel-2, two, uh, level 2A two, uh, time series, where we can reduce the amount of crowds and get a, a less noisy time series, and where we can increase the time series to get a five-year time series like it is the case here where you can see the development of vegetation uh, in, 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 this, in this point or polygon, and uh, you are able to do the time series analysis, analysis late, later. If you export the data to Excel, uh, you, have a, you have a table like this, you even have the cloud, cloud coverage percentage, and you can filter and select only the the pixels that, are, that do not contain clouds, and in this case, this is cloud percentage per selected area. So for my polygon, this means that these images did not contain any, any, any clouds. And we are getting the minimum, maximum value, the mean value, and the standard deviation. And this can be then used in time series analysis in Excel, if you want, uh, which is uh, a simple way to use uh, this kind of, of data. So we are now moving to the integration of radar and optical, uh, optical data and uh, the, the machine learning part. And I will be heading uh, the word here uh, to my colleague, uh, Matei. Thank you for the introduction and welcome. Uh, we'll take a look at radar and optical integration. And without further ado, let's get started. There are a few ways we can join this information. Uh, we can combine both radar and optical. Uh, by doing so, we wish to combine both the best worlds. Uh, this can be done uh, using machine learning, data fusion. And uh, with this, we are hoping to uh, create a combined radar optical vegetation index which can serve us for various applications in natural environment mapping or monitoring. One of such applications uh, could be uh, crop classification. As we can see in radar backscatter, and there are uh, obvious patterns and differences between, between wheat and barley, and even between different years. Similarly, it can be observed in optical uh, indices. Comparing here, we can see both NDVI and NDRE. Uh, we can see there are quite a uh, few differences in uh, various crops, such as winter wheat, cotton, spring maize, and other uh, various vegetation types. One of such applications can also be mapping grasslands, intensive and extensive. This can be done by tracking when a certain parcel has been mowed. This can be visible in both radar and optical information. In, for example, in NDVI information, we can see the value dropping once there was a mowing event and then quickly rising after as vegetation recovers. And we can see this pattern multiple times a year. Similarly, in case of coherence, we can see the values increasing as and the change uh, has happened in the parcel. And now, if we start with the machine learning, uh, quite often to refer to as AI, artificial intelligence, if you're following uh, any new publications and the news, you can you have must have heard of GPT-3, uh, of uh, OpenAI's new endeavor. Um, but this is quite often actually just machine learning, uh, more specifically deep learning, which is a subcategory of machine learning. And uh, the main difference between the two being the method that we use. Specifically, deep learning is more complex, or actually the method that we use have more layers, but more about that in the next slide. All machine learning has in common is the way that we need to, to formal, formalize our uh, 
uh, problem that we are solving, addressing. Whatever we are doing, we have to first define what is the result that we're trying to achieve. So if we take a look at remote sensing, for example, more of the a little bit more of intuitive problem that we're trying to solve would be scene specification. And this would mean, as shown in this example, that we're actually trying to give a label to the image and uh, define what it is that it is representing. In this case, I'm pretty sure that we can say that this is the res residential area and we can all agree. But we can also see that there are a few roads and a few trees in the image. This would what makes it a little bit harder for the model to different, but we can still see that it has no issue with the given image. Making the task a little bit more complex would be object detection. This would mean that we still have the same input and the entire image, and we output uh, the, each bounding box for each object that is detected. And we can see that in this case that we have buildings uh, properly detected and also a car that is marked. And we can see that each object has a probability. So this means that each individual object has this uh, similar label as we had before. And then the probability that it belongs to that specific class. While going even further, we have image segmentation. We still have the same uh, similar input, meaning that we input the entire image. And now we provide the segmentation over the entire image, meaning we classify each pixel, uh, we give it the output, and we can see this also as an image. And if we take a look uh, now for the green pixel, we can see that it belongs to building, but it could be also road, plants, and what. But as the probability is high for the building class, this is also what is indicated in our output. But uh, what is different for the examples that we'll be looking at is actually a pixel classification, which is different in from segmentation uh, specifically uh, on the area that it does not include the information from neighboring pixels, but only for that specific one. We could produce similar results as we have them here, uh, but in image segmentation, but this is not uh, the case, uh, but this is not, uh, the input is not uh, always the entire image, but just each individual pixel. This means that we can use different methods and different optimization to achieve similar results. And if we go a little bit uh, more specific into machine learning for uh, pixel classification, uh, for, uh, let's say that we are using a uh, decision tree, as we have an example here on the right. Uh, our decision tree expects uh, two uh, features as an input, normalized different water index and normalized different vegetation index. And based on whether uh, the value of water index is above zero, uh, we, are sh uh, we uh, give it uh, the value is true. And we are uh, we mark it as a water body, and if it's lower, we check the value of NDVI, and uh, based on the predefined threshold that is actually inferred from the training data, uh, we mm, divide it into the other two classes. But this here is only an example, uh, and the trees can and are more complex and are inferred during the training. Uh, this is actually when we prepare the data. We have to predefine uh, what our samples are, and each sample has to have a label. And based on that, based on the distribution in the data that we have, uh, the model then learns which pixels belong to a specific class, and then is able to come up with these rules. And with this, we are able to have a simple, simple classifier uh, that is able to produce, uh, produce a cover map. But even going further from this and making it a little bit more complex is the random forest, which combines decision trees, a lot of them. Uh, and the, those trees actually always work on a subset of the data that we have of the samples, both in the number of samples that it works with and with the features that we're working with. This is often quite important uh, as each, uh, as the trees would not differ. If they all had the same data, uh, this is why all trees are actually working just on a subsection. Maybe they don't have all uh, the features or 
in this case, maybe on, they're all working only on vegetation, maybe only on the water indices. Uh, but this is also then expanded when we have multiple steps of the time series and more features, uh, then they can adapt to specific classes or to specific conditions. And they are able to perform better than a single decision tree as uh, they are an ensemble and they're able to vote uh, to what they think is present on the given pixel and produce a more reliable result. While in the case of deep learning methods, we have more complex approaches. Uh, if you look at the first two lines, we can see that we have R sentence and CNN. And we can see that they both have in common neural networks. The first one being recurrent, meaning that we're mostly working with time series. And CNN, which are convolutional neural networks, which are have made their name the name for themselves uh, for address uh, for tackling visual uh, tasks where we're using convolutions to aggregate the neighboring pixels and the information that information that they capture and we can also take a look on the right side there uh, this is a deep learning approach as you can see there there are a lot of layers uh, stacked on top of each other uh, and uh, this is quite often the case uh, with the deep learning methods as they become more and more complex and they have more and more features that we need to tune. Uh, this is quite connected to the numbers of samples that are required in order to produce a uh, good result. But and this is not always necessary, as uh, uh, some have already uh, uh, introduced us to a self-supervised pre-training option, uh, meaning that we actually have time series that are not labeled and use those uh, to pre train our model uh, to uh, optimize the weight of the model, uh, which is actually hidden in each, of, which are hidden in all of these layers, and based on this, we are actually able to use much less information, much less samples to acquire uh, quite impressive results. As you can see here, are two examples uh, where you can see that the accuracy increases with uh, deep learning methods. Uh, we can go in further. We can actually knowledge transfer between different domains. As we mentioned before, this a solution particular is not limited to any particular re region or even a given task. It could be used for land cover, uh, land, uh, land use, land type uh, classification, or just the specific crop types, or specific forest types, or different really problems that we have defined ourselves. We can actually also uh, transfer this model between years, but this means that we have to adapt a few things, uh, specifically that we tell the model or that it is able to include this information of what year it is working with, or that it would be able to extrapolate what we have given it to apply and train and then test on the specific years that we're working in with. Uh, while this will affect the result, we can achieve quite interesting uh, knowledge transfer just by uh, using the ways that have already been pre-trained uh, for our model. Uh, we can actually optimize uh, our model uh, for a specific season, meaning that we don't use a uh, calendar season, uh, calendar year, as we usually do uh, when preparing such data because crops often grow quite differently from what uh, our calendar year is. Uh, and this can be also then adapted to a specific uh, region in the world. Uh, and uh, once we even divide this information even further, we can do season, season adaptation as crops can change within a given year uh, and are specific to each individual season. But quite often, we don't actually need to be that specific. We don't need to be uh, uh, go that complex into the methods that we're using. Uh, in this particular case, uh, to distinguish between extensive and intensive grasslands, this was the task that was given to us. Uh, and we uh, decided to first uh, look a little bit deeper into the time series that were made available. And we specifically then decided 
to use MDVI time series and coherence, meaning the change that has been observed for a specific pixel. And we notice that during each mowing event, uh, there's a drastic change in the time series, uh, as you have seen before on the previous slide. And uh, we actually only designed an algorithm that detects those changes. This could have been done with deep learning, uh, but it is not necessary. And specifically, why we didn't use it in this case was because the number of available samples to us uh, was actually very small, and it would be too small uh, to train a deep learning method as it has too many parameters to optimize. But we have to keep in mind that uh, we have to really be careful and inspect the data we're working with, because this is not always uh, so simple. Uh, mowing detection was one of the more uh, nice examples of uh, where this can be done, but we still need to uh, needed to verify our results. In particular, we uh, decided uh, and we used uh, the uh, Haber generalization, uh, which actually means that uh, we looked at each individual region uh, that we have in the country and uh, that has specific technological uh, changes that are actually uh, specific to that region. And uh, we can even see that that coincides with, with the distribution of extensive and intensive grasslands. And this is not specific just to one year. We can see here, we use two different years, and we can see that the pattern is persistent. There are some small changes, but we can see that in HAP1, meaning more of a uh, Mediterranean region where uh, the mowing is more frequent. We can see that the the grasslands uh, there are more intensively used, and this decreases. Uh, and uh, it's almost the same in the half pine, which is more of a alpine region, um, meaning that the the grasslands there are mowed less often. And this is quite useful. As we can see, and uh, that the, the intuition and the results that we have were and have been confirmed with an external source, without just using the the metrics that are available to us when we are using machine learning, and this can be quite often a good uh, safety check to see that we are actually going or moving in the right direction. And now let us start with the practical workshop. Uh, you have already been given the access to the GitHub repository. Uh, it will be also shared in the chat. You can access it through this, uh, through this link and through this QR code. And we can take a look here. You can see that we're greeted with the repository. Here is a quick description on how you are able to access this file. Uh, you can use the git pull command or download the zip file. Once the file is downloaded, open the download directory, right click on it, and extract it in the same folder. And by double clicking on it, we can see that we're greeted with the same file structure, structure as in the repository. In particular, we'll be working with the data and notebooks folders. Similarly, we can move to this uh, folder here in the repository, where we also have uh, the, in, uh, the particular instructions. By following the instructions uh, here in the repository, we can see that we'll be using the Anaconda. Uh, you can download it uh, from the official website. In particular, we'll be using the Anaconda prompt. Following the instructions, we can see that we first have to change our location. For me, this would be to change to download. R set minus master, practical. You can see that first I added CD before the path. This means change directory. And now that we are in this folder, we can see that we are greeted with data, environment, and notebooks. In particular, we'll first need to create the environment. This can be done simply by copying the conda environment create command. And it will be using the environment.yaml file, which has all the required libraries defined. And simply by running the command, 
the environment will be prepared. If you will have any troubles with it, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, but it should be running without a hitch. I have already done this command, so we will not be we, there is no need to wait uh, for it to finish. Uh, and now uh, we need to activate the environment. This can be done using the conda activate command. And the name of our environment is the EO. And we can see that at the beginning, uh, the name of the environment we're working with has changed. Now, as we are running uh, in uh, Python notebooks, we are going to need Jupyter Lab. Once you run this command, a new uh, window will open and you'll be greeted with the Jupyter environment. Similarly, as before, we can see that we are in the same uh, folder. We can open the notebooks and this is where we'll be starting. Once we were able to establish our environment and uh, run the Jupyter Lab, we can first uh, get our credentials, which will be used by our Jupyter notebook uh, and our program to download and access uh, the data uh, that we'll be taking a look at. In particular, we'll be needing uh, three, uh, three parameters. One will be instance ID, client ID, and client secret. Uh, this can be, all be found in Sentinel Hub dashboard. Uh, you have already created this account. And if you have not sent me an email, please do so now. And we'll be also uh, crediting you additional credits. Uh, so you'll be able to access and process more data. Uh, but uh, in particular, what we need to do first is actually go under uh, dashboard. We can see there is a configuration utility. And uh, you have to click this uh, green button which will enable you to create a new configuration. You can name it uh, however you desire, but you should make sure to select the Python script template and then create the configuration. With this, you will, be, you will have your first, uh, uh, your first uh, variable that will, be need to, uh, will need to define. This will be instance ID, and it can be found, found and copied under this ID column. To find the other two, you will have to go under authorized uh, clients, which can be found in the user set. In particular, you will first need to create a new authorized client. Uh, you can also name it uh, on, uh, based on the workshop or something similar of meaning, uh, but you will have to make sure that you will save the secret key as it will be shown only once, and uh, uh, it will be used uh, to access the portal uh, on all the data and to make sure not to share it with anyone as this is actually tied to the quota that you uh, can use uh, for how much, uh, how much uh, imagery uh, you can download and process uh, uh, with the given platform. I will not be showing these uh, steps uh, in detail uh, as they are represented here as I, we would need to blur out uh, my personal information Similarly, uh, as anyone could use uh, use it to access uh, our platform. So, if we take a look at how the practical actually uh, is divided, uh, that now that we have already signed up, uh, we are able to use the credentials underscore Sentinel Hub IPython notebook. Uh, we first have to also configure the Sentinel Hub .id file, uh, which will be storing our credentials. Uh, and we'll then just be confirming uh, the configuration that we'll be using. Then going on, we'll be using the Data Source Explorer, where we'll take a look at the data collection that is made available to us uh, through the Sentinel Hub. We'll take a look at the Evolve script and see uh, what uh, changes uh, can be made and how this affects our processing, uh, together with uh, an example of imagery retrieval and an example of uh, a simple visualization. Going forward, we'll be uh, taking a look at the Earth observation with state API. In particular, we'll take a look at a specific AOE read uh, and uh, how we can uh, download the specific time series uh, for, uh, for the provided geometry. 
while also visualizing the time series that have been uh, acquired. Uh, then afterwards, there is an external book that will not be able to uh, take a look entirely, but we will uh, we will briefly review it. Well, we will take a look at the extra land cover uh, notebook, but we will not uh, go too much into detail uh, as it actually encompasses all of the previous uh, notebooks. And it is uh, actually uh, the entire procedure. One would need to uh, split a, a big area of interest, download the necessary da uh, data, add the reference, and do the required machine learning uh, to achieve uh, and produce a uh, classification map. And now if we start uh, first with the first notebook, uh, the credentials, we can open, go back to the browser and open the credentials uh, sh.ipython notebook. Uh, this can be done simply by double clicking on it and we'll agree it with a new, uh, with a new tab. And in here, we can see uh, that we have the Sentinel Hub ID uh, file, which can also be find, found here on the left side. And if we double click it, we can see that here is actually where we'll be inputting our information, the instance ID, client ID, and client secret. I will be closing this window, and I will not be running this command as this would actually uh, reveal uh, my, uh, my credentials. And I'll be simply copying uh, and uh, moving my already predefined credentials uh, into the notebooks folder and overwriting my existing file. Simply for you, we'll be uh, just running this command uh, and then uh, following uh, the following cell, as this will actually be the one that will configure uh, your environment. And you will have three lines uh, outputted below which will be uh, each individual uh, value being set up. And then just to confirm that everything is valid, you also run the left cell and you will have the output where the values will, will have been set. And now with the first notebook done, we can move forward to the data source explorer. And here uh, we can take a look at the data collection, the amount script, and the image retrieval procedure and the visualizations of the data itself. Uh, to prepare a little bit in advance, I have made the, uh, I have already uh, divided the area of Denmark into smaller regions. In particular, we'll be working, working with one EO patch uh, that I have selected and we'll be downloading the data uh, and uh, visualizing it in the Jupyter notebook. Going back to the notebook, uh, we can open the Data Source Explorer IPython notebook. We can see the Data Source Exploration starts with the uh, library's import uh, uh, cell, which defines the functions that we'll be using in this, uh, in this notebook to load and process the data that we're working with. Uh, in the second cell, we'll be also defining the data folder in which uh, we can find our uh, Denmark underscore bbox geojson file. Uh, this will be used uh, to uh, load the area uh, we'll be working with. Here in the first section of the notebook, uh, we already are presented with the Sentinel 2 L1C collection. In particular, we'll be downloading the RGB channels, uh, the band 4, 3, and 2. As I'm sure you're all quite familiar with the NDVR, here is also an example on how to uh, download uh, these particular values without downloading the entire image. We can actually calculate this already in the cloud. We simply we have to define the EOL script, uh, which uh, has the, uh, the channels already defined. Uh, in particular, we'll be working with band 4 and band 8. Uh, we'll also have to name in the layer that we'll be working with. And here at the bottom, we have the function uh, in which we pass the, in the two before mentioned channels and the operation in which we'll be calculating them. Similarly to before, we have to define the Sentinel Hub uh, tag. Uh, in this case, uh, we only need to pass the script that we'll be using to calculate it 
and uh, the layer on which we want to calculate the value on. As you might have noticed, uh, both of them, also, uh, both of the tasks have uh, one parameter that I have not mentioned. This is mass, max cloud coverage, which means how, man, how many clouds can be uh, on the image uh, in order for it to be still included in the process. The higher this value is, the more clouds we permit uh, to be included in the process. In our particular case, we'll be taking a look at the images in the year uh, 2019. As well, this is the patch that I have uh, selected in order for us uh, to further explore uh, uh, the EOLearn notebooks. And now we are actually uh, going to download the data. And, and this is done uh, by executing the task that we have defined before. The only thing is that we are still missing are the bounding box and the time interval that we have uh, defined in the cell above. This can be simply done, done by running this cell as well. And in the background, uh, we are reaching Sentinel hub services uh, to uh, download the data. Uh, and uh, by uh, already defining this uh, interval and uh, area, uh, Sentinel hub is already cropping uh, the available images and once the patches are downloaded, you can already see here that we have 19 uh, images with 1,000 by 1,000 pixels approximately with three bands. This is what we have already defined in the beginning, and which is the RGB colors. Similarly, this, in, uh, this needs to be run out for the NTVI test, which will be completely a bit faster as we are uh, transferring less data and doing the calculation in the cloud, which is also faster and more powerful than our each individual machine. Similarly, we can also see what, what timestamps are available to us. And this should be the same and should not differ between the two uh, different acquisitions that we, have, uh, that we have done. One of the tasks have completed, we can see the similar output as before. But now we actually have just uh, one channel uh, and it's added under data and NDVI. And similarly, as before, you can see that we still have the RGB values, and, uh, and this is all joined in a single EO patch that can then be used and referenced individually. The timestamps are exactly the same as before, but now we can see when exactly the images have been acquired. Once the data has been downloaded, uh, we can simply reference uh, what uh, subsection we want to be working with, in particular, uh, the RGB values in this case and visualize them simply by using the ax in show function which will be taking the uh, the individual touch step that we want to take a look at and uh, uh, displaying the image that we want to see similarly we can calculate the median values which can also show us uh, how the observed area would look like without clouds as we can expect the, those values to be much higher Similar procedure can be done with MDVI. When we are presented uh, with the values and the vegetation, uh, how it, and we can see quite well uh, where the areas of urban and vegetation differ. We can quite simply also calculate the, uh, the MDVI uh, time series by specifying uh, an an area that we want to calculate it for, and then plotting the values. A similar procedure can be applied to Sentinel-1 data. Uh, we only need to, need to change the data collection that we are using. Here, it is changed to Sentinel-1 descending, and also the bands and band features that we want to be working with. Here, we are specifying the descending and the ascending track. If you are interested in any more detailed information about the data that is available, it, is, it can be found on the uh, Sentinel Hub repository under the docs.sentinel-hub.com. And you can here read about uh, each individual data source, and that is how it is being processed, acquisitioned, and uh, how in what shape or form it is available uh, in the Sentinel Hub. Similarly, as before, 
we can uh, run the task of just downloading the data for uh, the desired uh, area and interval. Once the data is downloaded, we can visualize it simply as uh, similarly as before. But in this case, we can take a look at the percentile calculations, the 80th and the 20th percentile, while also visualizing the standard deviation under the blue band. Simply, we can uh, do this by uh, predefining the variables for each channel and then constructing and concatenating the array and then visualizing it as an image. There are various ways of joining this information and how we can combine it, uh, depending on what we want to emphasize in each individual image. And in this way, we can actually also see and compare different, uh, different images or acquisition times. If we take a look at a particular example, uh, we can say, uh, take a look at uh, having the first image as uh, red, uh, the, the third image as green, and the 11th as blue. And we can see how the area changed throughout the year and how it, the acquired images uh, represent that. We can see that, as we mentioned, uh, that we have the blue values uh, being the latest uh, change, meaning that uh, uh, wherever there is blue, the values were the highest uh, uh, only for the last image. And now before we start with the third notebook, and the Sentinel Hub actually has data in various, uh, we can access the Sentinel Hub data in various shape or forms. In particular, we'll be taking a look at VCS request using a script uh, that is actually uh, written in Python similarly as before. But the main difference is using the Sentinel Hub statistical API. And we can do this uh, by using a GeoJSON. And why is this important is actually because we can specify, as you can see here, an example of a GeoJSON format, the area uh, where uh, we want uh, the data to acquire the data. In particular, we have here uh, marked uh, five different fields, regions, uh, an example of a meadow, of agriculture, water, forest, and urban. Similarly, you can see them here. And we'll be taking a look at how actually we can access this data almost uh, instantly without even downloading the images, only downloading the specific time series. Starting with the third notebook, the retrieval of data using a statistical API. Similarly as before, we have uh, the importing of libraries in the first few cells. Uh, and specifically, we'll be adding the Sentinel Hub statistical download client and Sentinel Hub statistical. And we have a few helper functions in the beginning, which will enable us to parse the information that we'll be acquiring. Similarly to before as well, we have the eval script, but in this case, we'll be accessing all the bands. And you can see now that we're also adding a CLME and CLP layers, which are in particular masked uh, and are used to mask the data uh, as cloud mask and uh, cloud probability. As before, we can also add the NDVI values, uh, we can see here that we have each uh, pixel being evaluated and, uh, by predefined uh, equations. Uh, you can also add your own just simply by following uh, these procedures. We'll be taking a look at Kran. This is a town in Slovenia. And similarly, as we have done before, we can specify a bounding box and the time interval that we want to work with. Before we download the statistics uh, for the region, we can first take a look uh, at what uh, information, what area we are working with. Uh, as before, uh, we can uh, uh, specify the collection, but in this case, the difference being we'll be using a VCS request but we will be again defining the layer, which is the true color, uh, and downloading it at 
60 meter resolution. Additionally, here you can see that we have specified a data folder. This means that whenever we'll be re-requesting uh, re these images, uh, the script will first check if we have already downloaded them. So this procedure will not be uh, rerunning and re-downloading and using our quota necessarily. In this case, you can, you can see we have acquired 37 images, and we can start by visual, visualizing a few of them. We can see that in this particular case, uh, the area uh, on the first image uh, was not clogged, while uh, this is not the case for all of the images. But this can be later handled and processed in the later steps. But what we are in particularly and most interested in is uh, calculating uh, the information already in the cloud and then just downloading the time series. This can be done with the Sentinel Hub statistic uh, package. And here we additionally specify uh, the interval that we want uh, to operate with. Uh, this defines uh, when uh, at what uh, time steps we'll be aggregating the information that we have. We have to define the calculations that we'll be using. Uh, this means what uh, values will be aggregated and returned to us. Uh, in some cases, uh, we want to uh, calculate the mean or median. Uh, but this can just be specified and passed uh, in the calculation and then adjusted uh, based on the individual area when and what we are working with. Similarly, as before, uh, we now are actually able to join all of these predefined uh, attributes uh, into the Sentinel Hub statistical function, which will be actually. Uh, getting us the data. When you'll be running this uh, function for the first time, you can expect it to take um, quite uh, quite longer, uh, as this data is already accessible on my PC. Uh, it only uh, needed to uh, read it from the catch folder and load it into run. In case you have any uh, errors, uh, they look like this. And you can uh, just make sure that the request that you're sending is not uh, being timed out, or that you not have um, that you don't have any issues with the processing uh, before proceeding forward. And this can be uh, simply view, uh, the values that we have received can be simply viewed by specifying the data, and then the actual inputs, uh, the outputs of the each individual time step. But now, before we uh, visualize the time series, uh, we would like to uh, reformat the data so it can be easier or simpler to understand. This can be done by just changing it into a data frame and the, uh, changing uh, all of the values into columns. We can still see here that we have values for each individual band and the percentiles as we have them defined before. As you might have noticed, the values range around 5,000. Uh, this is done so uh, that uh, we do not uh, transfer float values over uh, as they are, require much more data uh, and, uh, um, and take longer to transfer. Now that we have already prepared our uh, table, we can go forward and visualize the information that we have acquired. We can see the values now are distributed at least for n divided between minus one and one. And we can also confirm this on the graph. But now we can see that the values uh, and uh, the time series is really jacked. Uh, we uh, would need to further remove the clouds in order to improve this visualization. What we have done above was actually for the whole area of Kran. 
but what we're interested in particular is actually just the geometry and the particular types uh, of land that we have specified in our GeoJSON file. We have to first make sure that it is in the right projection, and then we can simply uh, pass on the request to Sentinel Hub statistical uh, client, and it will download the data for us. Once the download uh, has finished, we can check and we can see that we have exactly as many uh, uh, time series as we have uh, specified in our uh, data frame. Again, similarly as before, we have to uh, normalize the data. The values are around 5,000. And now we can simply visual visualize our time series. And we can see the time series are quite jacked as well. But this is uh, due to clouds, which can be removed. And here we can mask them using a CL mean value. And we can see the values have already improved. But we also have one additional uh, option to filter by CLP. But this I will let uh, for you uh, to try out and test in your own notebooks. Before going to the final notebook, uh, we will uh, take a look at the standard procedure in EOLER uh, by defining uh, the region of interest similarly as we have done before. In this case, for extracting uh, the water extent, we can see that uh, we simply download the satellite imagery for a specific region, uh, mask the clouds, uh, extract and calculate the NDVI feature, uh, use the threshold, and then we can simply vectorize the extent and save the result. As you can see, the procedure is quite straightforward. And so this is, uh, can be made and it's simple because of EO workflows uh, that we can apply on any region, any area of interest that we have uh, at our disposal uh, or that we have reference data for, uh, and simply uh, by defining the um, uh, the area that we're interested, the country, we can split it into smaller tiles, download uh, the, the information for each individual one, and then uh, use uh, any complex method or processing in order to achieve the required results. The last notebook in particular shows how we can do uh, machine learning for our example. And as we have some time constraints, we'll be only overviewing the notebook, but you're more than welcome to run it yourself, uh, as you will have more than enough credits to uh, process this data and acquire it um, in case you will have any uh, different uh, applications or uh, desires. Uh, here on the right side are also a few more examples that are available on the uh, you'll learn uh, workflows and uh, workshops, um, and you will be able to find something that suits your needs. Uh, and if you have any particular um, requests or uh, questions, you, will be, you are more than welcome to write and address them to me. And now to the left notebook. The left notebook is a guide on how to uh, create land use land cover predictions, in this particular case for Slovenia. Uh, it's divided into parts. Uh, we'll not be running through them, but a quick overview would be that in the first part, we are actually preparing the data, preparing the, uh, dividing the region, uh, and only taking a look at the five by five area, as this is uh, quite, quite a hefty task. And uh, a five by five area is manageable for most uh, computers. Uh, and it's a great start, uh, but you can also change this later to any country or to any uh, area size or any year of your particular design. The, uh, in the second step, uh, the data is downloaded using Sentinel Hub uh, by package, uh, and then uh, the NDVI index and the water index is calculated while we also add the reference map, which is also provided in the repository. In the second part, the data preparation for machine learning takes part, uh, including the construction of uh, the model and training, and then also validating the model 
and uh, visualizing the results. Similarly, as before, we are first greeted by the import, and then, as mentioned, the area definition and visualizing it, while in the second to the fourth, we'll be actually downloading the data, defining the tasks that will be adding it, and defining the workflows in order for us to automate the procedure. Here are a few definitions of the land use land cover map and the colors that will be used in the end to visualize everything. Here is also the reference that is being used uh, it is uh, it uh, is consists of the ten classes mentioned before, and here is the entire procedure uh, summarized again. In case you will have any questions, uh, you will also be able to email us. Uh, but uh, the script uh, should be working without any issues, and it also has uh, some good visualizations, which will be uh, showing you if you are on the right path and. Uh, how the data that you're working with is actually uh, actually looks like, and uh, how uh, how it changes throughout the year. And in the second part, as mentioned, is the machine learning pr uh, data preparation and procedure. Well, you'll be actually uh, running the model and training and running the model on uh, on the patches that have been previously downloaded. Here is the entire uh model training <clears throat> first we simply have to uh prepare the data uh in order for the model uh, to train on it we here divide it into train and test set uh which is then used as the input uh, onto the uh, lgbm classifier and uh, uh you can save it on your computer so you can use it at any other time and uh, see how uh, how the results compare between different runs in case you'll be changing the parameters or any particular input to the model. Here you can also visualize the confusion matrix, which will actually indicate and uh, tell you how well the model performs. Uh, but more, I suggest that uh, a more in depth uh, information that you find it on the internet, as there is a lot of uh, interesting. Uh, things that can be uh, optimized uh, depending on what is the problem that you're dealing with, including different uh, metrics that can visualize your model performance. You can also evaluate which uh, features are among the most important for the given task that you're working with. And uh, you can also visualize how uh, and what information uh, was uh, was uh, was done by the model, uh, what was predicted by it, and save it uh, as a test in order uh, to be viewed in any other uh, spatial uh, program that of your prefer uh, of you, that you prefer. With this, uh, I would uh, conclude uh, the practical part and would like to invite you to change and switch up the parameters uh, that you have been using uh, and the area of interest that uh, you want to be working with. In particular, I would encourage you to use the statistical API as you can uh, calculate and uh, get um, a lot of information for any particular region that you're working with or points of interest without much uh, complication and uh, quite quickly, uh, as you do not need to download uh, the images and the entire images to your local computer. With this, uh, uh, I welcome you to uh, uh, also to write us an email in case you have any questions and would like to thank uh, uh, the organizers and uh, Krishna uh, for of providing us with this uh, informative workshop. Christophe and Mate, thank you for the wonderful presentation and demonstration. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage before the start of next week's training. 
Below is the contact information for Christophe and Mate, along with links to the training webpage, website, and social media. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings. And please follow us on Twitter for future relevant announcements pertaining to NASA's Earth Sciences. We've been receiving a lot of terrific questions so far. Well, I want to thank everybody that has submitted a question. Uh, we still have about 25 minutes left in the session, so there is still time. If you have a question that you want to ask either uh, Dr. Oshtir or, or Mate, uh, please do uh, put it in the question box, and we'll get to it um, as soon as we can. So question number one, could you please tell us more about the Harmonized Landsat Sentinel or HLS availability on Sentinel Hub? How do we access it? So the Harmonized Land Sentinel uh, data is available on Sentinel Hub in the same way as any other data. So there is Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, and Landsat 8, 7, and so on. Uh, we have listed here a description of the data set, and it's uh, easy to get it either through EO browser or, or through statistical API. So what Matei has shown can be done also with harmonized lens and sentinel uh, data set. Wonderful. Question number two, how do we classify crop types in tropical areas, especially in proximity to forests? I imagine that the NDVI fluctuations might be smaller, so we are more likely to misclassify crops. Maybe I'll answer this one, uh, if you can hear me, of course. But yeah, we can hear you just fine, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so actually the NDVI changes, uh, depending on what vegetation can be found in a particular area. And actually it would be misclassified only if the, the signal would be really similar. That is why it's really important that we have a strong uh, signal for each class that we are actually trying to classify. And it really is dependent on the training samples that we are using. Uh, so actually, once we have this, uh, it can also we can explore uh, how and what classes are actually phenologically similar when we are working with the data. If if I may just add, maybe NDVI or optical data would not be enough for tropical areas. So you have to use also the radar data. Wonderful. Question number three. Since the central wavelengths on Sentinel 2 A and B differ slightly, is that something we should take into account or somehow correct for when using images from both satellites, example given for classification purposes? Uh, no, the answer here is no. Uh, these are almost identical satellites. The, the slide that I have shown is just a demonstration that they are not exactly the same satellites because they have been built uh, in different phases with different uh, with different methodology, but uh, the user does not have to uh, make any differentiation between S, 2, A, and B. Great. Well, hopefully that puts a uh, concerned mind to rest, uh, that you can use both of those interchangeably. Question number four. But, but, but there, there might be there might be something, but uh, the geometry of Sentinel-2 and Sentinel, uh, Sentinel-2A and B is not exactly the same. So it's uh, the pixel shifts can be bigger between the two satellites than the spectral reflectance changes. Okay, question four. Do you normalize the crop time signatures by latitude or for seasonal weather? Uh, the growth curve for any crop will vary by the date planted, the weather, and the growing degree days. Yes, this is true, and uh, it would play a big role if we would be producing a map for a continent, but uh, we would have to adapt the calculation and the areas and calculate everything connected to that. Um, but this is not uh, especially adapted to multiple seasons uh, or uh, within a year that we are working with. Um, that is why we usually use deep learning. 
and we let it uh, learn the features and it can do it so by inferring it during training and this is actually uh, a specific topic that can be also explored and if you're really interested into it uh, i suggest that you look at knowledge transfer and concept shift just to name a few Wonderful. And question, uh, thank you, Mate. Question number five, uh, is Sentinel Hub free to access? Is it possible for a student not to pay for that subscription? Yeah, the, the short, short answer is uh, Sentinel Hub is uh, not for free uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, however, uh, the basic functionality of Sentinel Hub is free, it's in both Sentinel Hub and uh, EO browser. And there exists a lot of sponsorship, especially for researchers, scientists, and uh, students. Uh, I would like to invite you to have a look at the ESA Network of Resources uh, web page, where you can apply uh, for sponsorship for Sentinel Hub, but also other services uh, that ESA is uh, sponsoring. And all the RC participants, if uh, they register and email their uh, their Register email to Matei will get sponsorship through through the same network. Ah, terrific! That is wonderful. And thank you uh, both Matei and Christoph for helping to organize uh, those those sponsorships for these participants. Very much appreciated. Question number six: Is the data from Sentinel Hub original data or somewhat downscaled? No, this is a very important question, and uh, it comes uh, several times uh, regarding the, the, the data. No, it's the same data that is uh, being used if you download the data from the, from the, from any platform, so the, uh, the original files are the same. Uh, however, if you are looking at the EO browser, of course, the image that you see is reduced because there's no need to have the the original raw data, if you are just looking at a, a, a large area, so a city or even a region, and it is therefore computed on the flight from the original uh, data, resampled and computed. So, but uh, you can get through Sentinel Hub, especially through statistical API, the original data in a matrix form. So you can get an uh, array or X array, a numpy array with the original values. And in addition to that, you can get subsampled uh, values, so different spatial and spectral subsampling. It's uh, the same way as you, you uh, subsample a matrix in Python, a very similar way you could get uh, subsampled data from the Sentinel Hub. Great, thank and you. For if stuff. I add the statistical API, uh, and actually just downloading the data from Sentinel Hub, uh, you, you quite often can accompany, accompany Sentinel-2 at least with the uh, CLP, which is the uh, Cloud Probability Mask, which is uh, a bit of an improvement uh, from what is originally available. So you're able to mask the clouds a little bit better. Yeah, that, that, that's, thanks, Mateo, for pointing this out. If the data is actually uh, supplemented by additional masks uh, and additional uh, information that is very useful for statistical analysis. Great. Thank you both, Christoph and Matei. Uh, question seven, are the points in the time series representative of each period, example, like a month, or is it the chosen area's mean? Uh, okay, the, the samples that we have been showing uh, are an average uh, of the in our spatial average. So we have selected a, a length parcel, and you can select many parcels. You can have vector data for this, and the average or basic statistics for that area, mean, minimum, maximum, standard deviation, are computed for each time step. So we get the statistics for each time step. However, the statistical API also enables you to do the time aggregation of the data, like computing the maximum value in a certain period of time or computing the average value in a month, in a week. That is uh, being performed in the cloud. And when you are getting back, back the statistics, this is uh, the information uh, that, you, that you are getting. So the answer is for 
at a particular point in time to get the spatial statistics uh, uh, for, for, for the area. Thank you, Christoph. Question eight, does Sentinel Hub support exporting .csv stats via the API or only through the browser as shown? Matei, if you want, uh, you can answer. Basically, yes. we, have started, we have started with EO browser just for the demonstration purposes, but Matei, you can go on. Yeah, the, um, but uh, we would quite often actually suggest using the Python script that we have uh, added, and you actually have uh, way more options, and you're very flexible in what formats, uh, what are you doing, what are you using. So really, you can explore uh, many uh, different various things and analysis once using the Python, uh, Python API. I would say if, if for basic playing you could just use uh, eo browser select the area and download the csv and explore it in excel but for any practical work uh, statistical api is the way to go great question nine is very similar to question two that we received earlier it has to do with the uh, vegetation index in the tropics so how important is the ndvi method for monitoring crops in the tropics area tropical areas because of the cloud cover? Uh, yes, this is uh, similar to the question before. Uh, the solution to uh, monitor crops in the tropics is uh, to use radar in combination with uh, optical data uh, because the cloud coverage is, uh, for any area where the cloud coverage is high, uh, radar might be uh, the only option. option but when we are using uh, machine learning, especially deep learning, we can use radar. Uh, we can use radar to to compute the the, the NDVI uh, data from from it. And we have included here a link to a paper where uh, radar Sentinel One was used to compute the uh, the NDVI uh, and then use this uh, simulated or computed values for time series analysis. Uh, great question number 10. In the Sentinel Hub EO browser, can we upload ground truth shapefiles of, of area of interest for getting time series? And can we download the results of analysis or do we require a license? Uh, uh, yes, you can download the statistics uh, on any uh, shape that you have provided and you will be actually able to uh, download it similarly to what we did now during the uh, the uh, examples that we've shown but you would not require a license to do so and you're free to share these data as well wonderful question number 11 is maintaining the balance of the classes or the number of class specific pixels in the mask essential when classifying something or making a mask necessary? For instance, 90 pixels for a woodland, 100 pixels for water, etc. Yeah, and this is quite important, especially uh, depending on what uh, machine learning model you're using. But quite often, uh, we, when you have such minor differences, this is not a problem. But when it's, uh, for example, a 90% uh, difference between the majority and the other classes, uh, this needs to be addressed. Uh, and uh, we have to adapt uh, our model, our training, our machine learning to this. But this is also quite connected to what we're trying to achieve uh, with the machine learning that we're doing. So usually you iterate, you choose something, one of these uh, uh, approaches, and then you see what actually is able to uh, bring you closer to the desired result. Great, thank you, Matei. Question number 12, uh, it asks, how small was your sample? Uh, our sample in the uh, EO browser was, of course, uh, quite small. It was uh, half a square kilometer, uh, but this was just for demonstration purposes. You could see that uh, we have computed uh, the statistics uh, in, in real time and uh, with, 
However, you can use the larger area, uh, multiple polygons, uh, and uh, compute the statistics uh, uh, with uh, on a rather large area, or let's say uh, a, re a smaller region or something like that. Uh, however, having uh, be aware and uh, monitor the Sentinel Hub um, data data processing usage in the Sentinel Hub desk. Uh, great question number 13. Um, how do you classify those crops which have very similar phenology cycles, uh, example, barley and wheat or sorghum and pearl millet? This uh, actually uh, can pose quite a problem uh, and it's difficult, but it's really important, uh, even more important in these, these cases, that we have a good training data set um because otherwise the accuracy will be low and we will be confusing the classes and uh, we usually expect that the dominant crop actually the one that occurs more often will have a higher accuracy um but uh, we might be able to overcome this uh, with really dense time series or even multi-year data uh, when we are talking about extremely dense time series we are thinking about the planet's data which is actually daily daily data of course the, the planet data is not available uh, for free wonderful question number 14 can we work with all of the can we work with all the 13 bands of sentinel 2 and how seamless is it to use this to estimate biomass Well, if, if, if I start, yes, we, you can you can work with all the 13 bands coming from uh, from uh, Sentinel-2. They are all available. Uh, as already mentioned, you can download the data and uh, process process the data. Uh, however, then you might use uh, only 10 meter resolution data, so the four bands, the red, green, blue, blue and uh, near infrared data, or the 20, the 20 meter uh, resolution uh, data. They are both described in, in the on the Sentinel Hub, and it's usually it's almost the same. So have a look at, at the web page, and uh, you will see uh, that it is very similar, similar to use either level one C or level two A data uh, with all the bands or a subset of bands. But have also in mind that you can use also the indices, so you can compute several uh, vegetation and other indices and uh, uh, forget about the, the raw bands and use just uh, indices time series. Uh, and regarding the biomass estimation, there are studies on estimating biomass using Sentinel-2 data, but the result depends on the, of course, the quality of reference data, and might, you, you might require also LiDAR, radar data, and uh, similar sensors. Question 18 is, how can we set a specific range of each band to display a satellite image? Uh, example, uh, band four in the red channel with a limit of zero to 0.5 percent reflectance. Likewise, for other RGB bands. Uh, yes, uh, this is a very good question, and uh, the answer is yes. You can uh, change the visualizations on uh, your browser. First, you can just select different bands, and that, then you can use uh, you can use custom uh, scripts. Uh, for, for the visualization. And custom scripts are actually Java scripts uh, where you can specify the range of the bands, you can compute the statistics, you can compute the minimum, the maximum, the percentage that is uh, displayed, displayed. And these Java scripts can also be more complex. They can uh, compute uh, different indices, as I already mentioned, or they can make uh, other uh, visualization like thresholding uh, and so on. So it is a very, very efficient way. And this uh, this uh, JavaScripting interface can be used both with your browser for immediate visualization, but also as an input for Sentinel Hub uh, API. So you can use the same script to uh, get the data uh, visualized in your browser or Computed, the statistics computed uh, with Sentinel uh, Hub uh, API. There's uh, actually a web page with the custom uh, scripts that are available. 
and you can get all the scripts or many scripts on uh, GitHub uh, already. Uh, the, the link to the page will be listed in the, in the notes. Uh, great. Question number 19 has to deal with uh, interferograms. So how do you generate interferograms from Sentinel-1 data? Uh, generating interferograms uh, with uh, the, the, the stream is still frozen at my side, so uh, I, I don't know if uh, this has been uh, uh, resolved. Uh, so to generate interferograms, we are using uh, SNAP. SNAP is a software that is uh, available for free from uh, European Space Agency, uh, and it is a very uh, useful software for processing both optical and uh, radar data. And if you want to generate uh, interferograms with uh, Sentinel-1 uh, data, you have to download single loop complex uh, data. Uh, and uh, then you can process this data locally, uh, either uh, manually with SNAP or automatically with Python scripts and uh, SNAP uh, graphical, uh, uh, graphical workflow. Uh, and this takes quite some time. No. So there will be a link to SNAP download and uh, to tutorial for processing this data. And in addition to that, we have been speaking about the access uh, to, the, to, to, to the Copernicus data through, uh, through different platforms. And one of the platforms is called CreoDias, which is not free. And this is, uh, according to my knowledge, the only one that has already co pre-computed coherence uh, Coherence data. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Christoph. Question 20. Where can I find the information I need to fill the instance ID, client ID, and client secret fields in the sentinelhub.id file? Uh, this information can be found in the Sentinel Hub dashboard. Uh, and if you'll go uh, through the recording again uh, in a self paced, you'll be able to see there is a slide where it is specifically specified that instance ID can be found under configuration ID, ID uh, utility, client ID can be found under users, user settings, and while the secret, secret ID, uh, client secret will be actually visible uh, once you create a new client and you will decide on uh, what to name it and you will be able to uh, see the secret, but only for one time, so uh, make sure to copy it somewhere. Great, uh, thank you, Matei. Well, we are nearing uh, the top of, or I guess the end of the, the training. We have two minutes left. As we conclude the second part of the training, uh, this uh, the English session, uh, as we wrap up, I did want to give both uh, Dr. Oshir and, and Matei Ratchet uh, an opportunity to maybe any closing thoughts or comments that they might have for the participants that are still on today's call. And Dr. Ostier, why don't we start with you? Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure uh, talking to, to the participants, answer their questions. Uh, yes, I believe that we live in a wonderful time for observation. We have dense or very dense time series. We have all or almost all the data that we need. Now we have to use this data wisely and we have to use machine learning methods, but not, not in methods, but we have to be careful to provide uh, very good uh, or clever solutions uh, to, our, uh, to our environment. Uh, there was also a question regarding Sentinel Hub uh, as in the frame that Planet has bought, bought Sentinel Hub. Uh, I believe that not a lot will change with uh, Sentinel Hub. It, the company uh, will remain, or, uh, even in, in the frame of planet, uh, it will remain uh, providing the same services. Uh, it will be actually even better integrated with other, other data. And Matej, did you have any closing thoughts or comments for the participants? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was. It was quite a pleasure, and uh, seeing so many questions, I really am looking forward to uh, what advances will be there, and hoping to see all of you on uh, any upcoming conferences to share and see what we have been up to. And don't forget to use the Sentinel Hub credentials you have. 
Yes, this is this is a terrific opportunity for for everybody that's participating in this training. We do strongly encourage you go explore Sentinel Hub, uh, see its applications, its utility for your own research, for your own uh, work. If it's you know if it's if some type of operational work that you're doing in the field of of agriculture, etc., definitely do take advantage of this opportunity and the credentials that you have to explore uh, Sentinel Hub. It's a, a really great opportunity that uh, that is being provided. Uh, we want to thank uh, very, very much to uh, Dr. Christoph Ostier and, and Matej Racic for an amazing presentation and demonstration. Uh, thank you both so, so much. For all the participants, we will be, uh, if we did not address your question, because uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but we will finish uh, answering all of your questions and we will post this this uh, word, this doc to the training page by next week. So next Tuesday, when we have the final part of this webinar series, we hope to have this uh, finished, edited, and on there so that you can uh, see, get an answer to your question if it was not uh, answered today. So thank you to all the participants. We, we uh, Wherever you're joining from, uh, whatever time zone you're in, we, we, we greatly appreciate you joining us today. And lastly, I wanna thank the RSET team uh, who's working in the background to, to make this training possible. Uh, that's Sarah Cutshaw, Brock Levins, and, and Natasha. Uh, so thank you everybody for, for joining and we look forward to seeing you in our last part of the webinar series next Tuesday. Goodbye.